listen, when you go out on that floor, don't walk out on that floor unless you intend to win. But not win for us, win for yourself. How's it going? You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 524, with our guest, Hanshi Allen Libby. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what we do, visit whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest place to find our products, including apparel, equipment, training programs, and a lot more. If you do go over there, make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Helps let us know that this show leads to sales. Everything for the show, we keep that in a separate place. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you the show twice a week. And the goal of the show and Whistlekick overall, well, it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and inspiring traditional martial artists throughout the world. If that means something to you, if you want to support that work, you can do quite a few things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, leave us a review, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up a book on Amazon, or support the Patreon. If you think the new shows we're releasing are worth 63 cents each, not to mention all the back episodes you get access to, consider supporting us at the $5 a month tier. Visit patreon.com slash whistlekick and sign up. And if you do, we're going to give you more content. Today's guest is a thoughtful male, a man who started training as a kid at a time when very few people trained as kids. That experience clearly shaped his martial arts philosophy, his training, and as far as I can tell, his life. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed it. Here we go. Hanchi Libby, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. I'm excited to uh, be interviewed. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, you know, it's not, most of us don't get interviewed day to day, right? I mean, we have people ask questions of us, but usually it's some kind of official thing, right? You know, you go to go to get your license renewed and they ask you all kinds of questions. It's not usually fun and very rarely is it about martial arts. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. People can interview me about martial arts all day long. I mean, that's fun. And we, we built a whole show around that. There, there are people listening all over the world who like hearing people answer questions about martial arts. I, I like the martial arts. I like to talk about the martial arts. It's been a part of my life forever. Forever, ever? Like how, how old were you when you got started? In the 60s. Okay. I was about seven years old. Wow, that's that's really young for that era. Yeah, yeah. How did that happen? That's there's got to be a story there. Well, there is, there is quite a story there. My, my grandfather like, used to get out and stay in Rochester with my grandparents in the summer, and my grandfather used to go down to Hanson Street, down to the uh, local bar, and lo and behold, there was a martial arts studio upstairs. So he would stay downstairs, and I'd go upstairs, <laughs> and then, that's how that's how I got into it. Now you said Rochester. Which Rochester? It seems like Rochester. every state has one. Rochester, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Wow. So not, not too far. Not too far from, from where I am and where I grew up. But same here. It's about 32 miles from, uh, from where I live. And what was it like training in the 60s? Which for maybe some of the younger listeners, they, they may not know, but oftentimes people refer to the late 50s and the 60s era of martial arts in the United States as the blood and guts era when it was, you know, the pride seemed to be that instructors would, would beat on students so much that they didn't want to come back, that there was a point of pride in, in training them so hard that they didn't want to do it, which, I mean, forget the counterproductivity of that and how silly it is. How, how did a, a young child um, navigate that? The first time I went in there, because uh, Grandpa took me up there and he, he knew the instructor there, and the uh, first time I went in there, I was scared because it was mainly all adults. And uh, so I, I sat out and watched quite a bit. And finally, you know, as time went on, keep going in, I, I decided I'm not just going to sit here and wait. I, I want to get into this. And as being a kid, um, I was kind of like, I don't know, I was kind of like pushed aside at first. But then uh, the adults would finally got me into into their classes, you know, and uh, it was, it was, it went, it went all right. It went all right. I kind of like had to prove myself that I was going to take a punch. I was going to, you know, be able to take a slap out. Now you said mostly adults. You, so you weren't the only child in there. There was another boy that was in there with me. 
and his name was Roger. And, um, but that was, we was the only two. Ahead of the times. Now, how long did that last? What, what, what were those early years like? I mean, take, take, us, take us forward a little bit. The more I went into the studio, all right, the more I went in and I got used to it more and more. And uh, everyone was getting used to myself, of course. And it, it actually got easier um, the more I went in there. S- things were tough. I mean, there was no, there was no, uh, there was no babysitting. And you had to do what you were supposed to do. And so it did get easier. Um, the sparring aspect of it was, it was a little brutal. But it did get easier. It did get easier every time. We trained. And we was expected to train. And we was expected to punch. And we was expected to block. We were expected to follow along and keep up with everybody else. Anybody who's taught children knows that they're, they're kind of too groups of kids who step into a class you've got the kids who are there more or less as daycare they go maybe they have fun while they're there maybe they try but it's something that they they do and then you've got other kids who go home and they're practicing and they're kicking the dog and they're breaking lamps and their parents are telling them hey stop doing jump kicks off the couch which one were you (laughs) i was a kid that was breaking lamps (laughs) <laughs> my my grandmother had this beautiful shower rod and, and it was uh it was a glass shower rod it well actually it wasn't a shower it was a towel holder you know by the shower and uh i used to practice with that a lot it, it was it was about three feet long and uh, i used to practice with that quite a bit until one day i broke it <laughs> <laughs> you got in trouble didn't you Oh yeah, that was that was bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you know, I was very, I was an active kid. I was an active kid, and the more I got into it, the more I liked it. And I liked what it did for your body. I liked what it did for your mind. What else were you doing that was active? You know, as you as you got older, and maybe school sports opened up. Was there anything in there? Martial arts was it. Martial arts. I, I really. I didn't feel like in other sports that it, it just didn't click with me where the martial arts did click. Everything about it clicked. Other sports I tried, but it just, it wasn't enough for me. It wasn't, it didn't seem to be challenging. And martial arts remain challenging. Yes. Obviously. And it's still challenging to this point. <laughs> and so you started at seven, you know, what, let's say, let's say early teens, 13, 14, what was going on for you then? What, what was, what was your training looking like? The more I trained, the more harder I wanted to train. You know, um, the more I wanted, there was something else out there. You know, so I, I kept looking, kept looking for it. Um, I kind of would jump to studio to studio. And in, in, in that time, that was not a good thing to do. Masters and instructors, they did not like that one bit. But I, I just was still looking for that challenge. So I didn't really know yet that. You know, I thought the challenge was in the arts, but it's not. The challenge is within yourself. Where did you settle? Did you, did you end up settling in a particular school or, or style? Yes. Yes, I did. I, I did uh, Taekwondo at first. And um, Taekwondo, it, it just it wasn't enough for me. You know, we, 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 we weren't really supposed to use our hands back then. It was all feet. And um, so I settled into Kempo, and that's where I found we could use our whole body. That, that to me, was just amazing. That started opening up the list for me. What, what was that transition like from Taekwondo into Kempo? Totally different. It's like, it was like football player to a swimmer. Was it challenging? Yes. Yeah, very challenging. Very challenging. I got, I got to use the whole body, and I had to, I had to figure out how to use my whole body. It was really, it was on the mind. It was challenging on the mind also. Tell me more what you mean about that. Well, with using your whole body, of course, now your mind's kicking in play. You had to become one. Your body had become one with your mind. And and your mind, your mind tells your body what to do, of course. That's your command center. So now you're in this thinking, well, 
yes, you can do a jump up, step up, spinning kick, but your whole body's got to connect with that. Your mind's got to connect with it first for you to be able to do it. And Kempo, is that where you remained? Yes. Yep, to this day, still in Kempo. All right. All right. And what was it about maybe the instructor or the way it was presented that, and, and, and maybe, maybe you, you kind of answered this, but I, I kind of want to go deeper. You talked about look, what I was hearing was you were looking for more, that there was something, there was something that was missing mm-hmm. in those other schools. And, you know, so you, you said in Kempo that you had to use everything. Mm-hmm. But if, as someone who we already saw is predisposed to looking for more and more challenge, what was it about Kempo at, you know, early teens up till however old you are now that's kept you there? I mean, that, that's... The instructors. Okay. The Tell instructors. Me more. I'm very non non nonsense people. Very non nonsense. I mean, you, they had a, a set of sequences you did, or they they asked you to do, and they expected them to be done, and you couldn't move any further until those were done, to the you know to their standards. So they they put that challenge out because it's yourself. You yourself had to defeat that challenge. No matter how many times you practice it over and over, they didn't move forward until you had that down to their standards. Was that frustrating? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, very frustrating. <laughs> you know, you, you do your techniques, you do them over and over, and you, you're thinking, I got this. But you know what? And, and, and they come in, and they just show you one little hand twist or one little move that you uh, didn't do or you neglected to do, and it was like, oh, back to the beginning again. So in the end, in the end, you know, when you finally got that, you finally took a smile across your face and said, yes, okay, I understand what he meant. And let's fast forward a little bit more. Let's say, you know, out of high school, mid, mid-20s. What's going on for you then? In my 20s, it was great because I felt invincible, of course, you know, <laughs> as any 20-year-old would. Sure. And I just, and I started to get into the tournament scene more and more and, and, the tournaments were, were then, they were, they were brutal. I mean, the, the, the glove, there was no gloves, there was no pads. There was, there was your hands, you know, your bare hands and your bare feet. And, and you know, they, they, of course it got bloodied up a little bit, but, you know, it, it was, again, it was self, self-satisfying to get out there. You know, of course you got punched or you got kicked, but you brushed it off, man, you kept on going. How far did you travel competing? Oh, we went one story to Connecticut one time to this yeah. tournament. We went in, and, and, and this tournament was very, it was a very big tournament. And uh, the uh, instructor had us go in, and he says, listen, when you go out on that floor, don't walk out on that floor unless you intend to win. All right? But not win for us, win for yourself. All right? So... I always carried, I always remembered that. Win for yourself. So we got out of the tournament. We, we, uh, we brought our trophies out, so we're proud of them. And uh, he says, oh, line them up here. Okay. And he, he opened his trunk, took a golf club, and hit the trophies, broke them, said, now bring them back in. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was, because he was challenging you every minute. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that, that was, that was a big challenge even more. Bring him back. How, up. how did you react to that? I did not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, that would, I, man. I I, that was my trophy. I, yeah. I back. But, you know, the trophy aspect of it, that was the trophy. In the end, you know, you 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 knew you you knew what you did. You knew you won it. So uh, that was part of a hard time too. Sounds like this instructor had some uh, maybe some interesting teaching methods that oh, maybe yes. wouldn't be appropriate in today's world. Oh no, they, not today's world. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, the, the hardness of the martial arts. It, 
you know, who who is to say what was appropriate, what not? You know what I mean? Because there, there was this many incidents, you know, that might have happened to us like that. I'm sure has happened to other people. Out there. Certainly, two totally different times. Totally different. Now, at some point in there, you started teaching. Yes. How how, how did that happen? I'd go into the classes and and um, just feeling good about the arts and looking around, seeing what it did for other people and people that was under rank below me. And I, I got thinking about, you know, the fact is, you know, these, these folks, they may want more. They may want more just like I did. So I went to the, the head instructor and I asked him permission to teach because back then you didn't just go grab a belt, start teaching, you asked. And it was kind of hot wrenching because he said, you haven't deserved it yet. You haven't earned that right. Mm-hmm. I said, yes, sir. And finally, maybe a year or so after, he said, you're, you're, you can go out and teach on your own. So I started doing that. But I never really opened a dojo then. I'd, I'd teach out, you know, in, in, in a park or I'd teach, you know, on a lawn or whatever. And that was just satisfying for me. What do you think changed in that year between not being ready and being ready? The want to. The want to, the want to share with the other folks. Want to share with other people. You know, making sure that I was ready myself to start teaching. You know, making sure that what I was showing other people was right for their selves. Not just for the arts, but right for their selves. That's a lot of responsibility as an instructor. Yes. And anyone who hasn't spent time as an instructor doesn't fully understand what that means. Correct. What, what was it like when you started? What was that, you know, the first, the first few people you, you worked with, or I don't know if you would call them classes. You're, you're, sounds like you're kind of downplaying the formality when you started, but I'm, I'm curious how that felt. It was a scary feeling because you really weren't sure if you was teaching the right thing for them. You know, learning it yourself, you know, you, you, you learned it and took it into your mind and body. It was right for you, but everybody's different. You know, they may not be able to do some of the things that you're trying to teach them. So therefore you had to adapt a little bit in order for them to do that. You know, so that was, that was scary. You know, you, you didn't want to be really hard on them, but you wanted to be hard enough so they understood what they were doing. So it was, it was scary. Mm. Do you remember when that went away? Still have it. <laughs> really? Yep, still have it to this day. Why? Because everybody's different. Everybody mm. needs different things. Not everybody needs physical aspects. You know, not everybody needs the mental aspects. You know, the, the spiritual aspect of karate also. Um, you know, somebody that comes into dojo today, they may come in for a whole different reason than physical. They may just need to um, socialize. You know, they may need to uh, get over a, a, a stump of being able to be in a class or in a room full of people. So it's, every, every, it's still different to this day. It's still, it's still challenging to this day because People walking in the door, they're not going to tell you what they need right off quick. They don't even know you. So you, get, you have to get over that um, thing of getting to know them and what their needs are. And you, of course, you don't want to teach, teach them the wrong, the wrong thing to do. Sure. Sure. And it sounds like you take it really seriously. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been... It's, it's been a lot of fun and, and, and a lot of uh, growing up and, and being able to help people. Mm. I still do. I still take it uh, serious. Most of the time, in my experience, when someone goes off on their own to do anything, you know, run a business, teach martial arts, pursue a hobby, they've got their own ideas of things they want to do differently. Probably in their mind, better. So when you started teaching, do you, do you remember any of those ideas that you had? Say, oh, I'm going to do this this way, and I'm going to teach that that way. 
because this will be better. Yeah, I didn't want I didn't want the brutality to be in there because it just as time elevated, you know, as time went on, the the brutality kind of started fading out of the way. You know, people were in want to do this for different reasons. So I, I didn't want to have people fear walking in the door. I wanted them to walk in the door because hey, I, I think I would like to try that. And so how did that, how did that manifest? What did you, was it just in sparring? Was it in the way you ran the class? The whole dojo setting, okay. the whole dojo setting. Um, I didn't want to be too lapsed, but I didn't want to be overly hard either. I didn't want people to feel like, because I was young too, but I didn't want people to feel like the first time I walked in and going, oh my God. <laughs> how old were you when you started teaching? I think my first class when I started teaching, I was 19. Oh, wow. That is young. Was that ever an issue? Yes. That was a big issue. Being that young and, and, and some folks coming in, they, they kind of look at you funny, like, you're, you're going to teach me to defend myself? You're, you know what I mean? They, they, they looked at you funny. Yeah, very true. But I told us if you if you want to learn Kepo and you, you want to come in and do this, I will teach you. I will give you the best that I can. When I finally opened my own dojo, it was I was 28. I finally opened my own dojo, my own building, and it was behind my house. I built it behind my house, mm. down in the woods. And you walk down through this rampway down into the woods, and and the building was probably. Gosh, 12 by 18 building. And there wasn't no padded floors. There wasn't no padded walls. It was just, it was plywood and, and you know, just boards. And, and we, we ended up, you know, having quite a few students out of that. And then this is Dojo way off in the woods. No one ever heard of, you, you know, and, but people would come. People would come. It's like that old thing, build it, and they will come. <laughs> right. <laughs> that time, that's still kind of on the on the tail end of you know, martial arts schools not having signs, and you got to know somebody who knows about it, and, or maybe it's even invite only, you know, added to the mystique. Correct. Because that's basically what our school was over there. It was invite only. Because I really didn't I, I didn't, I just didn't want anybody and everyone to go through. And one thing, it was at my house, so, right. you know, that caused a per that, you know, created a problem. But, um, but it worked out all right. It worked out all right. That, that building was there for years and years and years. Even when the, even when I sold the house, and even when the building, years later, the building, they actually collapsed from snow weight. The only wall that was left in the building was one that had our patch on it, Juan Karate Academy. And that, that was the only wall that was still standing. Almost. Maybe not even almost, but symbolic. Yes. There's, yeah. there's something there. Yeah. And that, the, the dojo was in uh, Tuftonboro, New Hampshire. It was out on Dame Road, way off in the woods. And so where did you teach out of next? After that, I went to, well, we moved to Ossipee, and we found a place down in uh, Alton. And we taught out of Alton for a long time. And uh, that was a two-story dojo. It was two floors. Hmm. That was a wonderful, wonderful dojo. It was, a, it was an old uh, Grange Hall. And the, the Grange Hall, it had a rounded ceiling. So that kind of it kind of made everything even more mystique because of the rounded ceiling. In there. And thank God, because we, we had plenty of room for us to do staff work, three sexual staff work, finally. The dojo in Toftaboro was, um, the walls were only eight feet high. So when you'd spin the staff of stuff, you had to be in a real low stance. <laughs> so I, finally, I know the pains of doing, doing weapons work with, with low ceilings. And hmm. uh, I, I've, I've known plenty of people who've broken overhead lights, working bow in the living room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Yes. So finally the the 15 foot ceiling to the top was yeah, that was a blessing. We stayed there for a long time. We was in the altar for a long time. We and had you, uh, 12 schools at one wow. time. Oh, okay. And um, that's a lot. Yeah, it's it, and the headaches came with 12 schools. You know, um, you know, you had to make sure that your instructors were all up to date on everyone, and yourself had to be up and date on your instructors and all the people in all those dojos. You know, it was, and the times were just right in that era for to have dojos like that because the martial arts was kind of at a high then. Was this mid eighties? A mm, little bit, a little bit towards the nineties. Okay, towards the nineties, and uh, finally in the about ninety. Five ninety six, the martial arts started to fade off and fade away. So we had to combine some of the studios, and that was okay. It was okay too. Made it more personal. We've got quite a few school owners listening, and I'm I'm wondering if you might indulge me and talk about how you went from a school you built, dojo you built in the woods, to a two floor school to twelve. How'd you go from 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 one one space to twelve. I mean, that's very few martial arts schools are ever going to get to twelve. Most don't make it to two. So how how did that happen? A lot of heartache. Was it intentional? Did you did you wake up one day and say, "I want to expand"? I did wake up. I want to expand, but I my thought was I want more people to be able to do this to do the things I really really like to do, and and have the people experience that. So to experience that, a lot of people, you know, they didn't want to drive or they couldn't drive or their families didn't want to drive. So we'd bring the uh, studio to different places, different towns. And it, it took a lot, but, but in the end, uh, I believe it was worth it. It was worth it. What kind of spaces were you teaching out of? I would rent a space like uh, one space we rented down in uh, Wayfield, New Hampshire. It was it was an old like in a grain mill, and we we fixed up a part of it. It was it was it was probably small. It was probably twenty by thirty space a floor space on the floor, and. You know, of course, you had your office space and the bathroom space, but it all worked. Those those were the spaces. They weren't uh, luxurious spaces. They were little back corners of little buildings. And we'd go in and work on them and, and get them so that uh, we could do our classes. May I ask how many students you, went, you had at, at the peak with those 12 schools? Oh, my goodness. That's a good question. I never really counted students. You know, I re never really counted students. We had probably then, with all all the studios, probably then five or six hundred. Wow. wow! Was this your full time job? No. Oh, okay. So on top of this, you were doing something else. Like, what else were you doing? On top of that, I worked for the state of New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah, during the day in the studios at night. But I had some real good people helping me, you know, in the studios and real good, competent instructors, just like, just like now. Yeah. The instructors, we all had the same goal. It wasn't to look at a student for the rent or the lights. It was to look at the student for the student, for the people. I would imagine over these years, this many programs, this many students, this many instructors teaching under you, you've gotten pretty good at teaching teachers which is a subject that creates quite a bit of discussion in the martial arts because, let's face it, most of us start teaching with very little instruction on how to be a teacher. You know, we right. kind of wake up and say, I know this stuff. I enjoy this stuff. I want to share this stuff. And we figure out the rest the hard way. But I, I'm going to guess that you set your instructors up for a bit more success than go figure it out on your own. I had one instructor. Master Javon, he was very, very good on 
explaining things on, um, you could do it this way, but don't be surprised if it fails because he's done it before that way. He's done the same things, you know, and he would tell me, he wouldn't let me just fail. He would tell me that certain things are going to work and certain things aren't going to work. And sometimes you're going to find out yourself, but just keep, keep building it, keep building it. And he helped a lot. He helped a lot in that. We went on, Grandmaster and I went, uh, during the years, we, we went on and we had, we had a good relationship, but there was a time when we went different paths, different ways. And then at one of the studios, one time I had, this gentleman walked in the door and I was, I was teaching the class. And I looked over and it looked kind of familiar, familiar to me, but I just, I couldn't pick it up. I couldn't get it until he kneeled down and put on his belt. And I went, oh, my goodness. You know, because back then the respect was very, very big. And another martial arts instructor walked in the door. You stopped the whole class. And you told everyone to please face the door. Well, that night I, hadn't, I didn't do that. You know, um, but after he kneeled down and put on his belt, you know, I, I knew it was him. And then from that time on, we was reunite, united again. That made me feel real good. Martial arts instructors often have stories like that where somebody splits off, there's a there's a division. Yes. And it happens so often that I've I've wondered, is it is it kind of part of the growth? Is it inevitable? And I'm curious what you think. I think it is part of the growth. I, I think it is. And, you know, way back in our deep minds, we, we're, we're in the studios and we're training, and, but we're also training our mind as maybe it's time to leave the nest, you know. Maybe it's time to get out there with some ideas on your own, you know. And, and maybe it's time, you know, to leave that path. And more than often, you know, you're out there teaching in your schools and something happens. And you look back going, huh, if only Grand Master was here to see that, or if only Grand Master could see that, that thing happened, you know? And, and you're right, you're right. It, 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 does, it does happen, and it happens a lot. I think it happens more so nowadays than past, past years. Why do you think that is? I think everybody, I think, not everybody, I think, because a lot of folks is, is, are quick to, I'm over my dojo and I'm gonna make tons of money. Well, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you spend more money and you make it. <laughs> mm. so I, I, yeah, it's a monetary thing, I think. Mm. As I've said often, opening a martial arts school is a great way to work really, really hard and make a little bit of money. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I was uh, coming in the dojo one time, and, and, and uh, Jihan Brown was with me, and there was a dime on the floor. I reached down, I picked up that dime, and said, hey, we made some money today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But the experience is the best, the experience you have with your students. Sure. If someone was to ask me who my favorite instructor was, of all the instructors I might have had or all the people I might have worked with, I would dare say my students, the students, because they're the best instructors. Tell me more. Tell me more what you mean by that. When you're out there and, and you have, say you have a room full of uh, students and you're showing them maybe a particular kick, all right, and you show the students that kick, that kick has to be right because they're looking at you for guidance. If you show them that kick only half heartedly, that's what they're going to do. Because they're looking at you for that guidance. So it has, to be, it has to be right. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be right. Or even in techniques, the same thing. If you show the technique half heartedly, when you expect them to do it, they're going to do it half heartedly. But if you do your technique the good and you, you feel good with that, they're going to do the same. Can Not be to, exhausting. 
holding yeah. yourself to that standard. Yeah, yeah, yes. Not that every student has to do it perfect, but in order for the technique that you, you show, in order for it to work, you know, it's got to be done right. Sure. Now, let's say we found a time machine and we could roll back to right around that time at 19 when you started teaching. And you could sit down with yourself, maybe have a cup of coffee or something stronger and offer advice. What would you tell yourself? Wait. That's Wait. Not, that is not at all what I expected. <laughs> okay. Why? Um, to train more, to train my mind, body, and spirit more in the arts. Um, to, to go out and, and, and find more out about the arts. The arts are so big, no matter if it's Kempo or Kido or Jiu Jitsu or whatever, it, it's so big that, that, that there is aimless amounts of techniques, you know, and to find the right ones for you. Uh, uh, the styles that I studied, I didn't use, you know, every technique I ever learned. I put together a group of techniques that worked for me and that I thought would work for other people. So I, I think I would have waited a little bit. Instead of taking the responsibility on studio, studio. Because mm -hmm. you were in the studio at, say, 5 at night. Sometimes you didn't leave till 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. One of the subjects that's often discussed is the role of a martial arts instructor. Very few people say it's, it's just about teaching martial arts. You know, everybody tends to go off in different directions with it. What's your definition? What is a martial arts instructor in your mind? To be able to wear many, many different hats. You know, to be able to wear that hat of when you see a student over there and, and they're in tears. And, and you don't know why those tears are coming down, but to be that person that can go over and say, well, step out of the classroom and let's talk. You know, because we don't know what they're going through. We don't know what all these people are going through. You know, every person, if you have 12, 15 people in a class, each one of them are going through a different emotion. We was always taught when you walk in the door, you leave your emotions outside. Well, that, that really never can happen. You can, you can leave your emotions outside to, to get into the martial arts class, but they're still in your mind. They're still there. So to, to role model. Role model to help, to help people. Not only that, but through life. I guess a life coach. I guess a good word would be life coach. Mm. Mm. That's a word I often use, too. You don't need to name names. But I'd like you to think about some of the students that you've had and maybe think of one in particular that you were really able to fill that role. Maybe somebody came in under conditions of adversity and you were to help foster, you know, you, you helped with their growth for some period of time. Maybe, maybe talk about the changes that you saw. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was, there was this, this one boy that was very, very challenging. And um, he got in uh, a lot of trouble. And um, I, I, just felt, I felt drawn to the kid. I felt really drawn to him. Um, and it got so that, I, first of all, he, he came to the house, into the dojo, and every day was a challenge for him to be there. You know, he, had, he wore a long, trench coat <laughs> and I, even in the summer I'm like dude take off your coat <laughs> he was standing and he just watched the classes because his parents made him come and uh, finally I got him out here on the floor and he, he started to move you know he started to move good you know he was a big boy and, uh, but he still had these challenges he, he couldn't overcome so I, I got so um, I made sure he went to school. I got so I'd go visit the school to see if he was in, in his classes. And I used to go down to the office first and, and, and the principal and stuff. They used to let me make, go up and see if he's in his classes and stuff. And uh, sometimes he was, sometimes he wasn't. And he finally, you know, after a while, he ended up living with us. 
ended up living at the house. And, um, and he ended up being my foster kid. So I get that was a real rewarding time. Real rewarding time. You've spoken pretty positively about everything, everyone. I mean, it, it, I, I'm, I'm trying to roll back through and, and think if you presented anything in a, in a negative light. And I don't, I don't think you have. Is that typical of, of your personality? Are you a, a positive person? I, I think I am. I think I am. I'm, I'm sure I have my days when I'm negative. But I, I like to stay positive. I like to smile. I like, I like to smile and I like, I like to see other people smile. And if, if we're teaching classes and we're smiling, we're positive up front, the, the people that's in front of us are going to be positive too. My number one rule, I, I don't have a martial arts school of my own, but when I travel and I teach, my, my number one rule is I got to make sure they're having fun. Yes. If they're not having fun, I can't teach them anything. If they're having fun, I might be able to teach them something. True. So true. In my younger years, you know, fun was working hard and <laughs> hitting that Macquarie and breaking bricks and boards. And but then I, I saw people going, well, this hurts. Well, <laughs> it hurts. Well, get over it. You know? <laughs> After a while, you know, you, you come to look at it going, that, that, that guy's bleeding. <laughs> you know, it weren't fun for him to get his hand all bandaged up because he broke his finger or something. Mm. So I guess over the years I have mellowed. I, I guess I have. Here's a question for you. If you could train with anybody that you haven't, any martial artist, living or dead, we haven't asked this question in a while, who would that be? Grandmaster William Chow. Why, why him? Tough. Yeah. Tough. You know, the stories I've heard and, and the old videos I've seen and very tough man. Tough man. There was one, went to a seminar one time. He was there and he did, he said, I'm going to show one technique. And the guy threw the punch, he blocked it. Went down and hit the guy in the top of his foot. <laughs> and the guy just folded right to the ground. You know, it, it, for a punch to the top of the foot, you know, through the shoe. Yeah, tough. Tough. But on the mental aspect, I, I'd like to know what they were thinking. You know, I like to know what brought them to where they are. What brought, you know? Hmm. Is history important to you? Yes. Very, very important. Very important. Without the masters before us and before them, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Sure. Depending on the art, it seems that different martial arts tend to have more uh, institutionalized value on history. And Kempo seems to be one of those that does. I've known a number of, of Kempo instructors and they seem to be the most, some of the most passionate that I know in terms of knowing history and reading history and sharing the stories, you know, the stories that, you know, ultimately became the inspiration for doing this podcast. I think because Kempo, Kempo is big. It really is big. It's, 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 it's from a big, vast amount of other styles also. It's not just its soul style. And, and I think that's why. Um, and of course, the old, the old, I'd say the old days, but I'm pretty old myself, but the old time masters, you know, you know, they got together and I'm sure some of their meetings was not pleasant, but they still worked through it. They still got through it. Talk more about that. We're, we're in a time today where people don't seem to know how to get along and find compromise. So what, what do you think it was about them back then that they were able to do that? I, I think that back then the martial arts was a very physical, physical art. And yes, you could have a student come in and be physical with that student, but 
generally that student they probably, they didn't probably didn't fight back but where the when the older groups got together they fought back so they had to make sure that technique was on by you know either side and did did work otherwise it wasn't no sense of even teaching it because it was physicality whereas today we have to be mentally alert more and more today than than ever what do you teach your students on day one to respect each other to talk to each other when they come in there's usually a time when we we show them what we wanted to do we first thing when they come in through the door we'll go out we'll talk to them we'll have them come to the edge of the workout floor and bow to the camisa and we tell them you bow to the camisa for respect the masses before them the masses before them the masses before us so it's respect from day one and a lot of times we all put our belts on together. There's, there's no one in the studio. We don't put it on separately. Everybody kneels down and puts their belt on at the same time. And I, so I think that that creates that camaraderie of no matter whether you're first rank or you're, you're black rank or you're whatever rank you are, it's that camaraderie. We're all one. So that, I guess I would say to be all one. There was a time when in the studios, we all lined up, we're in front ready position. And I would tell the students, I want you to turn to the person beside you and say good evening. And they would, you know, and they did. It just, it just felt so good. It just felt, it brought energy into the room. And from that energy that brought into the room, if somebody happened to be leaning on the wall, I always tell them, don't lean on the wall. It takes energy out of the walls because they are filling this room full of energy. They are filling it full of, with the punches and the kicks, the tears, with, with their thoughts. They are filling this room full of that. So we all respect each other in here. It creates a group that's respected. And when they walk out there, um, no matter what group they're in, they're going to probably do the same. They're going to they're gonna find a way to have a respectfulness out there. Well said. I know the cops have done that for me. Mm. It makes me look at things so different, so different, in, even in a time of despair that, that we're in. Mm. Yeah. Let's imagine that five, 10 years from now, we get together and we, we have another conversation. And I ask you, you know, I would, I'd probably start that conversation off by saying, Hey, what's been happening since the last time we talked five, 10 years ago, what would you hope you would say? I would hope that I could say that people are helping each other more now, even than they were five or 10 years ago. I would, hope that we could be more united than we are now. Years ago, I started this program called United We Stand. It was back at some point in times, you know, the dojos always didn't get along. You know, there was, like even in, in the 60s when I was a kid and into the 70s, it was actually dojo wars where, where people just didn't get along. And if you you went to their space, or, or say a student left the dojo and went to another dojo, that didn't end too good for that person. So I, I decided we, we got to get along. So we made this, this thing called United We Stand, where we could come together and work together and work underneath the same roof and don't worry about who's the best style or who's the best kicker or who's the best what. Just, just be there for each other. Be there and learn. So I guess united unity, I guess unity. Is there something we can do as martial artists to help bring that to fruition? Yes, I, I do believe there is. And I think um, everybody is so busy, you know, 
in the martial arts schools, you know, you, you have to cover your overhead. Everybody's so busy doing that. You know, if we could go out and, and work out in the, in the fields like we used to, we could go out and work out on the grass we, like we used to and not worry about, well, the building, the lights, the phone, you know. If we could go out and do a lot of that stuff. I think we would see a lot of martial arts. Um, I think we, we'd even prosper more. You know, a lot of unity. Uh, we would go down to Athel Mass, for instance, to the Sikoron folks and work with them down there in the fields. And that was the best time. That was the best time. So or even go to Samerton, to Aikido, or wherever, wherever we want. And, you know, work together. Not worry about so much of the, what are the materialistic things, I guess? I think when you peel the, the stuff away, all we're really left with are, are memories, stories, feelings. Right. And it seems like the more stuff we have, the less space there is to create those. Correct. Correct. I studied with a grandmaster, uh, Charles Burdett. And I, I studied with him, and, and there weren't really, there was no rank, really. We had rope. He'd give us a piece of rope, and we, we'd use that. And as you progress with your techniques, it'd give you another piece of rope, a different color. You know what I mean? I look back on it now, those were the best days, man. So we're really, we didn't worry about a piece of cloth. <laughs> you know, you use that rope. You use that rope in your technique. You use that rope, whatever you did. You use that rope to, if you was being, you know, tested on your material, you use that rope to cross a river. But I see, I see belts nowadays going, it's a belt, man. It's a piece of cloth. So we, I guess even today we do have belts, but we use those belts as tools. We use them as tools. What do you mean by that? Uh, for techniques. Mm. Use them as, for techniques. Um, if we have a test in here, I'll have all the students take off their belts, and I'll have someone lay on the floor, and I'll say, I want you to move this person from this space. I want you to move them 20 feet up there without dropping it, but use your belt to do it. And they'd figure it out. They'd use it as a, what do they call them, a gurney? They call it, is it gurney? Yeah. They'd use it as that. So we wouldn't worry so much about a belt, you know, and, and worry about how we can use the tools we have around us. I just go off on a tangent there. You did. And that's, <laughs> I told you, that's, that's the hallmark of this show. It's what we love. Tangents are great. If people want to know more about you, you know, maybe your school, social media, website, you got anything like that you can, you can share that they could check out? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not very big about talking about myself. You know, I'm much rather talk about the arts, you know, and what sure. it's done for people. But yeah, we, we have, um, we have the Facebook, One Karate Academy of Self-Defense, and we're on Facebook. And I guess if, if People come in the studio or, or we train together. I guess it all, it all slips out during that time, you know? Now we've got thousands of people all over the world, all different styles, different ages, <laughs> listening to this at some point into the future, but to them it'll be right now. And given all the things we've talked about, we've talked about a lot of different stuff today. What what final advice might you give them if, you know, if we had to wrap this up into this nice, neat little nugget, you know, before we send them off into the credits as if this was a TV show, you know, what, what would those parting words that you might give them be? Don't be afraid to ask questions in the arts. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask your instructor. If he doesn't want you to know, he will, he won't tell you or else he will, Say, oh, why don't you find out yourself? But yeah, don't be afraid, because I was afraid to ask questions. You know, I, I was afraid to ask. You know, being a kid in the arts when I first started, it was, it was intimidating. There's this big guy standing up there, you know, and it's intimidating. 
but ask questions and know your history. Find out your history, because your history, without that history, we wouldn't be here today. I always enjoy talking with people who started training at that interesting 50s, 60s, that blood and guts era, that time when martial arts was something that so few people did. Would I have thrived back then training? I, I don't know. I do know that I have tremendous respect for those who started then and stuck with it, like Hanji Libby. I also really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing your insights, your wonderful stories. Hope to talk to you and meet you in person sometime soon. Want more? Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, see the show notes, sign up for the newsletter, find the photos, the videos, the links, all the things from this and all the other episodes. Every episode we've ever done, it's there, ready for you. Check it out. If you're up for supporting us and the work that we do here at Whistlekick, you've got some choices. You could visit the store, whistlekick.com, and use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off. Or you could share an episode, maybe leave a review on iTunes or somewhere else. Tell a friend about this show. Or you could contribute to the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. I hope if you see somebody out there wearing something with Whistlekick on it, you'll introduce yourself. And if you have feedback or guest suggestions, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Find all of our social media with the handle at whistlekick. And that's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 